Welcome everybody to the Formula SAE Upper Steering Design and Analysis uh, presentation. Thanks for joining us today. And a uh, big thank you to the Detroit SAE section and the Carolina SAE section for hosting this event. Um, a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. Everybody is automatically muted with their cameras off to, to maximize bandwidth. If you have any questions, we encourage you to use the chat function in the meeting. I will collect the questions and uh, pass them on to, to Tim at the appropriate times, and he can answer them uh, directly. Um, this presentation is being recorded, and it will be posted on the Detroit SAE section YouTube channel in a few days. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, please consider liking the video, sharing it with somebody who might find it useful, and subscribing to the Detroit Section YouTube channel. Uh, you can find past presentations on that YouTube channel. Um, and you can also follow the Detroit Section on LinkedIn, Facebook, X, formerly known as Twitter, Twitter and Instagram. Um, so we do have a couple more upcoming events. Uh, a week from today, there's a presentation on steering geometry and alignment. Uh, it's called The Car Goes Where the Tires Are Pointed. And that's another online presentation next Friday. Then Saturday, February 10th, we will have an in-person uh, workshop at Lawrence Tech in here in Metro Detroit uh, with several more presentations uh, put on in, in person that day. Then Saturday, March 16th, uh, the SAE Detroit chapter is hosting a student career fair at the SEMA garage in Plymouth, Michigan. Okay, and one last item. Um, you can go to the website at sae-detroit.org and register for any of these uh, upcoming events. So today we're gonna hear from Tim Drotar, who is a lead engineer in, vehicle, in advanced vehicle dynamics at Stellantis. Um, and he's going to tell us about upper steering system design and analysis. Okay, Tim also spent about 30 years at Ford Motor Company, uh, working in both chassis and vehicle dynamics. He is a longtime member of SAE, also the Sports Car Club of America and the Tire Society. He has a bachelor's in mechanical engineering from Lawrence Tech and a master's in mechanical engineering from U of M Dearborn. He also teaches some courses for SAE, um, advanced vehicle dynamics for passenger cars and light trucks, and fundamentals of steering systems, both of which are great classes. I've taken them both. Um, so Tim, I will hand it over to you and you can go on with your presentation. Thanks for being here. Great, thanks, Daryl. Um, always happy to... Uh... I was happy to be here. So, um, yeah. So, like we said, we're, we'll uh, today uh, we're going to talk about the uh, FSAE upper steering system, right? So, hopefully, uh, uh, you know, we'll give uh, the students the uh, the information or hopefully some useful information um, for the you know design and the in the tuning of your uh, of your steering system, specifically the the upper steering. So um, just a little uh, uh, list of you know what we're going to cover today. So we'll start with some learning learning objectives, um, give you some references, papers, books, websites, so forth. Um, we'll talk about, you know, what is this thing called the upper steering system? And uh, we'll look at the different uh, upper steering configurations typically found in a, an FSAE or a single seat uh, type race car. So we'll we'll talk about go-kart steering, um, something called a, a single uh, joint system, uh, a two joint system. Um, we'll go to, to, to details about the, you know, the anatomy and architecture of those systems, as well as the um, this topic of, of non-uniformity or the, uh, the output versus input variation that you get when uh, when we use things like uh, like card and joints um, to transfer the motion uh, between the steering wheel and the steering gear pinion. Uh, we'll talk about some other additional requirements of the upper steering system and then uh, and then close out just a, a summary. Okay. 
Um, so again, hopefully at, at the end of this presentation, we'll be able to describe the components that make up the upper steering system, um, differentiate between different types of, of the upper steering systems. Um, there's, there's some math involved. <laughs> so uh, we're going to you know, give you some equations that can be used to calculate the velocity and torque variation um, for single and multiple uh, card and joint systems. And then, like I said, we'll, we'll list some other key design considerations for the upper steering system. Um, these notes uh, created from from several sources. Um, what a really good reference on um, card and joints, or, or also known as universal joints, is the uh, the SAE Universal Joint and Drive Shaft Design Manual. Um, all the math is in there. Um, all the design, you know, inf information you would need to you know, design and apply um, any kind of, you know, card and joint, double card and joint, constant velocity joints and so forth. Um, although it's specifically, um, the specific, specifically uh, uh, reflects, you know, drive shafts, um, the, the physics or the math still, still apply to um, what we're looking at here, which is, uh, um, you know, steering, the upper steering system. Um, there's a couple SAE papers. Um, the uh, the third one down is is really good, and uh, unfortunately, it's in German, uh, but but uh, it's called uh, translated to Car Cardin Universal Joint Drives and Their Applications. And uh, I have uh, you know so a, kind of a, a translated screenshot of some of the some of that uh, book, but. Um, Again, a really good reference on, um, you know, like I said, card and joints and and so forth. Um, the 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 Pfeffer and Har book, you know, steering handbook translated into to uh, to English in 2017. Another really good resource. And then all always as always the, you know, SAE J670, the vehicle dynamics terminology, um, really good reference. And again, we should be when we're talking about vehicle dynamics and chassis systems, we should be you know, properly apply, applying the proper terminology as specified in that, uh, in that standard. Okay. Um, couple other notes on terminology. Um, during the course of this presentation, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to be consistent and, and call, refer to these joints or the joint shown here as a cardin joint. Um, occasionally I'll slip and, and say universal joint or maybe even hook joint, but, um, these these terms are generally uh, recognized as as being interchangeable. Okay. Um, the second thing is when we're talking about these cardin joint angles, um, I just want to to uh, really quick. I, we're going to refer to um, the obtuse angle of the joint, or so the orientation of, of the joint. Um, the ob obtuse angle is, as the spatial angle, and and um, in in two D, right? It's it's just a, an obtuse angle. But the reason we call it a spatial angle is uh, because, as we'll see, in some uh, upper steering configurations, typically more more common in passenger cars and light trucks, um, all the points are this this the these the input and output points on, of this um, cardin joint do not lie um, in a, a plane that is parallel to like a, a plane, uh, you know, vehicle, um, a plane cut through the the uh, longitudinal uh, axis of, of the vehicle, right? So so we, we use this term spatial angle to, to recognize that it, it, it's really a 3D uh, angle. Um, the other Thing. So the the acute angle here um, is we're going to refer to that as as the complementary angle. And when and you may have if you've worked in, in your car, if you've gone to McMaster Car or uh, Granger or something in, somewhere to get a um, universal joint or a carden joint, um, they would specify. You know, they'd say, "Oh, it's a forty five degree." cardin joint or a 30 degree cardin joint. And in that case, they're, they're talking about the um, the acute angle or the complementary angle. 
Um, we're going to, uh, in, in this you know, presentation, we're more, uh, we're, we're going to focus and, and use the, uh, the idea of the, the obtuse angle or the spatial angle. Okay. So here's a, a picture of a typical passenger car steering system, right? And so starting from the upper left, you know, we, we have our, our steering wheel and then going down the, the system, down the chain, we have the steering wheel and then the steering column. Um, this, and then we have what we call the intermediate shafts. And the intermediate shaft is the, the linkage that connects the steering column with the steering gear pinion. And so you'll see we'll have a steering gear and then the steering... Uh, rack is connected to our steering knuckle by um, by you know some kind of linkage. In this case, they're 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 tie rods, right? And so this uh, this system, we will break the system. We typically break the system up into what is called the upper steering, which is the steering wheel, steering column, intermediate shafts, and then the lower steering. Um, which is the linkages, the steering, the steering gear, the linkages, and, and the knuckle, and the dividing line, uh, typically between the, those two systems, the upper steering system and the lower steering system, is where that intermediate shaft uh, connects to the steering gear pinion. So again, the topic today we're going to focus on uh, on the upper steering. All right. So in a, in an FSAE car, right. Um, it's similar, you know, the, the, the steering system is, is similar, right? We've got a, a rack and pinion steering gear and not shown here, but we, we've got tie rods, um, for the, the go-kart, what we would call a go-kart type steering system, right? We would have our steering wheel and then we would have a, a, a steering column and an, an extension shaft that basically connects you know, straight line between the steering column and the steering gear pinion. Okay. So, um, you know, the, the advantages of this kind of design is that, as you can see, it's really simple, right? We just have to have, you know, a, a, a shaft, steering shaft um, that, uh, you know, that rigidly connects the output of the steering column with the input of the steering gear, namely the steering gear pinion. Um, the other thing you'll see is that you know, every degree, you know, for every degree or Newton meter of torque or every degree that we of, of, of um, steering wheel angle we put in, um, it goes into turning the, in theory, would go to turning the uh, the steering gear pinion one degree. So it's a one to one um, ratio between uh, steering wheel angle and steering gear pinion. Okay. Um, the, the, the challenge with this is that, um, it may require a, a more upright driving posture, right? So um, we're kind of fixed in where in the relationship between the the angle of the, the side view angle of the steering wheel, um, you know, with 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 the uh, vertical and um, our steering shaft. So uh, if you've again, if you've ever driven a, a go kart, um, you're, you're typically sitting in a more upright uh, driving posture. Okay. Um, the single, the next one is the the single joint steering system, and again, it's it so it's a, it's a relatively simple design. So again, we have our our steering wheel, we have our steering column, um, we've got some kind of steering column support assembly with some bearings um, that are going to support the steering column and also um, the uh, this the steering shaft, and the steering shaft is connected to the steering column. Um, by way of a steering joint. And so in this, this picture, um, this design, it's, it's showing what they call a double carden joint, but, uh, but that could be, you know, it could be a single carden joint. It could be, it could be a constant velocity joint. Um, but, uh, the main thing here is that, that again, we, we just have one joint, um, that is connecting the uh, one movable joint that's connecting the steering column, uh, with the steering shaft. Okay. Um, so advantages again, it's 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 a relatively still a relatively simple design. Um, it allows for for a more reclined seating position because now, as you can see, the as opposed to the go kart steering, um, we can have a flatter angle or um, 
or closer to horizontal um, of the angle of the steering column um, so that the driver could be more, more reclined and uh, uh, in the seating position. Okay. The other thing we'll see is that having this uh, joint, um, say if, if we had a carden joint between, um, you know, between the steering column and the steering shaft, we'll show that um, it does give us an opportunity uh, to achieve what we call variable ratio steering in that the overall steering ratio uh, changes with the, uh, the position or the angle of uh, the, uh, uh, the steering wheel. And we'll see more about that uh, uh, in a minute. Um, the challenge challenges are that if we, uh, in the case of using a, a carden joint, a single carden joint between the, the steering column and the steering shaft, um, the that pinion angle, um, the steering, the pinion angle input to the steering gear is going to to fluctuate uh, sinusoidally with um, you know with the steering wheel angle. It's going to give what we call some some non uniformity. Um, we'll, we'll talk more about that in, in great detail here in a, in a moment. Uh, we'll look at the math and the, and the physics behind that. All right. Um, the other thing is that we, we do need, a, you know, some additional support bearing needed for, for the steering shaft, right? Um, we can't just, we don't really want to let the, um, you know, the, the, uh, leave the, the, the steering shaft there as shown in this picture, uh, unsupported. Um, and like I said, in, in, the options here, we could use a double carden joint, we could use a CV joint, you know. Um, also, there are some, uh, I've seen some where we have, uh, you know, may have a, a bevel gear set or like a 90 degree gear set um, to uh, to translate, you know, the, the, the motion of the of the steering column into the motion of the, the steering shaft. So there's a lot of, like I said, a lot of, a uh, lot of opportunities uh, in here. Um, the last one is is an example of of what we call a two joint steering system, and so again, so we have uh, you know we have starting at at the top here we have some kind of you know column support assembly, some kind of bracketry and bearings that's going to uh, support the steering column. Um, shown here, we have a um, an upper joint and a lower joint. So the upper joint, we're showing a, a, a single carden joint here, the, the upper attachment, and then the lower the attachment, uh, the shaft attaches to the steering column, and then the lower joint, um, also a single carden joint um, that uh, attaches the shaft to um, you know, our steering gear pinion. And so this, this combination of the, the, sing, the carden joint, upper carden joint, the shaft and the lower carden joint, we call that the, the steering intermediate shaft, okay? And again, this is the advantage of this two joint system. It does, you know, because we can flatten out the, the, the steering column angle, it does allow for more reclined seating position. Um, unlike the single carden joint system, we'll see there's some math involved that if we properly uh, design this system, in terms of the the spatial angles and or um, what we call the phasing, um, we can minimize or actually zero out that uh, that non uniformity. Or um, if we want to have this what we call variable ratio steering, um, we can also you know design or specify the those spatial angles um, to give us a desired level of non uniformity that would in turn uh, give us some. Uh, that uh, uh, variable steering ratio that we were looking for. Again, the challenge is, um, again, the, the, the pinion angle to input to the steering gear is gonna fluctuate sinusoidally with the, the steering wheel angle. Um, and we'll see it unless um, these spatial angles are equal. That's gonna be one of the requirements for, for minimum non-uniformity is that uh, having these spatial angles at the upper joint and the lower joint equal to each other. Um, the other thing is, is again, you know, having an additional support bearing for the inner steering intermediate shaft. Right. Okay. All right. So, so for a passenger car versus a, a single seat race car. So shown on the left is, is a, uh, this was taken from A to Mac. 
um, and and shows a um, you know a, a an example of a passenger car steering system, and you could see that if we you know we have our our upper steering here, so steering wheel, steering column, um, we've got an intermediate shaft, and then we've got our steering gear. But you could kind of see that um, if you if you travel down from the steering wheel, kind of goes straight down to the steering column, then it has a little bit of an angle, probably that the upper, this has uh, the, that upper intermediate or that intermediate shaft needs to clear um, the, the accelerator pedal here. Um, I've I put the, uh, this is a, a, a brake booster here, um, ABS module, so forth. So as, it, as the, the, the column intermediate shaft is passing through the the dash panel or, or some people call it the firewall, you know, it may have to, that shaft may have to take a little jog to avoid, you know, to clear these components. And then, then it's got to go and, and connect up with the steering gear pinion and the, and the pinion um, as opposed to a single seat race car is not in the center. It's off to the, um, in this case for left-hand drive, it's off to the left-hand side of the vehicle. So you got to kind of snake this thing around and, and get it to meet. All right. So not all the components lie in, in the XZ plane, all right? As opposed to the single seat race car here on, on the right, you know, if you go from the steering column, if you cut a plane, you know, through this, uh, along the longitudinal axis and uh, through the steering wheel, like everything is going to be in a, in a straight line. They're all going to fall in that plane. So it's, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll say that uh, those uh, upper steering points are coplanar, right? They all just lie in this in the same line okay um all right so let's talk about this this single card and joint upper steering system so um so after after the go-kart system right which again is like the straight line between the steering wheel and a direct connection between the steering wheel straight down to the steering gear pinion, right? Which is this, the simplest form of, of upper steering. After that, you know, the, the, the single card and joint upper system is, is, is probably the simplest one because we have our steering column, we have a, a card and joint, and then we have, or some kind of joint, and then we have the, the steering, um, steering pinion, right? And so uh, this shows, so this, example shows here on the left is showing um you know using a a cardin joint um the one on the right is was taken from that sae paper um where i think it was it was a 1983 ford ranger um and it had a, a, a two joint system and they said hey what happens if we just have a straight shaft and then we put a double cardin joint in here um, and you say, well, why would you want to put a double card and joint? Well, we'll see in a moment. But the 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 re reason why uh, is because um, when you put a single joint in there, the angle um, that the if the axis of the you know steering column intermediate shaft and the steering gear pinion makes a spatial angle um, was really large. And so, as we'll we'll see here in a minute, that the the, uh, the amount of fluctuation output versus input um, is going to vary uh, with the, uh, the the that spatial angle. And so they say, well, we got too much fluctuation. What if we put a, a double card and joint or, or, you know, some kind of constant velocity joint in there, then, uh, then they were able to uh, reduce that amount of um, fluctuation. Okay. So we look at our uh, we look at our card single card and joint system. So let's focus specifically on this this thing called the card and joint or a or a universal joint. All right, and so we've got um, you know we've got this uh, this kind of a, a I don't know isometric view maybe of the uh, of of the card and joint. All right, and so the components of the card of this card and joint you know we've got some kind of you know input uh there's some kind of input shaft that connects rigidly to this input yoke and then we have an output shaft um, that's connected to the output yoke and the input yoke and the output yoke are connected by uh by some bearings right and uh so what it does is if we have a you know if we have a, a an angular input or an angular velocity on the input side 
um, we're going to get some corresponding uh, angular output, you know, angle angle output and and uh, and vo angular velocity, you know, output. Okay. And so, um, one of the um, so if we then um, look at the plane, if we if we you know connect the dots here, three three points, you know, so we have a dot, you know, a, a point at the, on the input shaft, a point on the output shaft, and we have the point at the the connection here, the center of the bearing. Three points define a plane, right? So we've got that gives us the plane of the Cardan joint, right? And if we then lay this plane flat on the ground, right? We look directly onto that plane, down onto that plane, um, a plan view of the plane. Uh, it gives us the, the, the spatial angle, what we're calling that spatial angle of the joint. And, and so it's, uh, it's right. And so that is the, um, that is the angle, uh, joint angle that we're, um you know we're we're interested in the the uh, obtuse angle if you will right. so um this is, gets a little uh probably the most confusing part about um ab about cardin joints is has to do with the orientation of the yokes okay and so I'll, t I'll do my best here to try to explain it. So um, say on, on the left, you know, we're looking down, we, t we, we focus our eyes down that, um, that, that input shaft, right? And so if we look down there we, we, and we see the plane, right? We've got this, this you know, this uh, edge view of the plane, right? And so we're looking at the orientation of that input yoke, right? So this red, the, the top one, the input yoke, the red one, um, relative to that plane. And so by sign convention here, what we're going to say is that the, you know, the, the um, input angle uh, to the, to the cardin joint is going to be um, the angle that um, the input yoke makes um, with a line or an axis that's perpendicular uh, to the plane of the joint. So when that angle is zero, we'll say that that input yoke is going to be perpendicular to the plane of the cardin joint. Okay. So when when we're the steering wheel, in this case, when the steering wheel is straight ahead, we're going to say that, you know, when, when, uh, when that zero, that, um, that, uh, input yoke is perpendicular, the, the input angle is going to be zero when that, um, that yoke is perpendicular to the, the, the plane of the joint. Okay. If we look at the output side, Right, so now this this magenta one, we're looking at the output yoke, and, and so now we're looking down uh, the output shaft here, right? And so, since these the input and output are these are you know perpendicular to each other, when the uh, when that angle now we're looking at the angle that the output makes with that edge view of the plane, and so when that angle is zero, that output angle is zero. That means that output yoke is in the plane of the Cardan joint. Okay. All right. And so you may say to yourself, why does that matter? Well, it will show that um, whether the input, whether the input is um, perpendicular to the plane or in the plane is going to uh, determine if that non-uniformity is a maxima at at zero or a minima at zero. And we'll we'll show the math here in, in, in a minute. Okay. So one of the probably one of the most important things is is with cardin joints is understanding the the orientation of the input and output yokes relative to the plane of the joint. Okay. All right. So the the there 
rotational relationship between the output shaft and the input shaft is, is given by this equation. We'll call it equation one. So the tangent of the output angle is going to be related to the tangent of the input angle by the cosine of that spatial angle or cosine of 180 minus that uh, that spatial angle, okay? Or the complementary angle. Right. Okay. So again, the, the alpha here is, is the spatial, what we're calling the spatial angle of the U-joint. Uh, theta one, the input is the angle that the pin of this input yoke um, has has been rotated from being perpendicular to the plane and the obviously then the the angle that the output yoke has been rotated from being in the plane of the joint okay so if we re rearrange that equation um, and we solve for the output minus the input or the angular variance um, we can see that uh, and, and we plot it versus the input angle um, so in this plot here we have input angle um, on the x-axis and we have the angle variance or the output minus the input on the y-axis. And so let's say um, if we look, uh, if that angle um, is 180 degrees, that spatial angle is 180 degrees, right? And so cosine of 180 minus 180 is cosine of zero, which is one. So that means that we have not kind of shown here, but it's the variance is zero, right? So the output is exactly the same as the input. So the difference is, is zero. But let's go to the, the extreme. Let's say what happens if that angle, um, that spatial angle is 135 degrees, or um, in this case would be 45 degrees complementary, right? And so the, the joint is, uh, uh, the, that angle between, um, the input and output shaft is 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 45 degrees. So now you can see that as we at zero, obviously the, the variance is 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 uh, zero, zero input angle. But as we rotate that input shaft, right, you could see that the variance becomes negative where the output is going to lag the input. And so we get to say 45 degrees here. Um, if we put 45 degrees input, our, our variance is negative 10. So that means we're getting 35 degrees of output. And then we go to 90 degrees and you can see output equals input. And then we go to 135 degrees rotation. And now our, our variance is positive. So our output is larger than our, our input. So now we've got... Uh, um, if we got 135 degree angle, the, the output is rotated to 145 and then it goes back to zero. So you've got this, this lag lead, um, situation here. Okay. So again, I think the two key points with this is that if we have a spatial angle that is less than 180 degrees, the output angle is going to lead or lag the input angle in a, in a sinusoidal fashion. And that, but the other thing you can see that the, the amplitude of the variation um, change, you know, changes as we, as we reduce that spatial angle more and more. So the first one, you know, this blue, you can see that 100, 165 degrees or, or 15 degrees, you know, we've got maybe at 45 degrees, we've got maybe arguably one degree. Um, we go to uh, 150 degrees or 30 degrees, it goes to four, and then 135, um, we, you know, we go to 10, right? So um, if we were to plot the change in variance versus the change in, in spatial angle, we, could, we would see that it would be uh, increasing and increasing nonlinearity. Variance would be increasing nonlinearity with increasing uh, spatial angle, okay? All right. So say we take that, um, you know, say, so now we, uh, so we have a rack, say we have this rack and pinion steering system. We put that single card and joint um, in the upper steering system. And so we're going to let theta one, the input um, here, be the steering wheel angle and theta two uh, be the pinion angle. All right. So now our equation 
is we've got a tangent of the theta pinion is equal to the cosine of 180 minus spatial angle times the tangent of the of the steering wheel angle. Um, if we solve or, or uh, solve this for theta pinion or the output, right, um, we can see that we get this equation, equation three. Okay. All right. So again, it shows us that you know when that when that spatial angle is less than 180 degrees, um, it'll it means that the the angular input to the steering gear, right, the, to, or to the pinion, um, is going to vary sinusoidally from the the angular input at the steering wheel, um, and so this in turn this is going to affect you know how much steering wheel angle is required to generate one degree uh, change in road wheel angle, you know with with increasing steering wheel angle. So it's going to affect what we call the steering ratio. Okay. Um, just a really quick, so kind of a little bit of a sidebar here on uh, steering ratio. If you you may or may not be familiar with this, but um, steering ratio is, and this is uh, from, uh, uh, you know, SAEJ 670-ish. Um, it's the, the rate of change of steering wheel angle um, with respect to the road wheel angle um, at a given steering wheel position. Okay. And so what I'm showing, we're showing here, this is some actual uh, real world data from K and C test of a single seat race car. Okay. And so on the left, uh, and so if you're not familiar with the, the K and C test, it's, it's called a steer ratio test. And so basically what we're doing is it, it in a, at, a, at a very simple level is we're putting in a uh, input, an angular input to the steering wheel, and we're monitoring what the uh, road wheel steer angle is. And so we would get one of the things we would get is this plot sure, shown here on the left, which is steering wheel position on the X axis. And uh, this is showing the left front wheel, um, the left front road wheel steer angle. Okay, and so if we take the um, if we we do a, take a derivative, um, basically or like an inverse derivative. So we take the derivative the the change in steering wheel angle um, versus change in road wheel angle. Um, what we get is this plot on the right, um, which is the steering wheel position again on the x-axis, and on the y-axis we have what we call the instantaneous uh, steer ratio. And you can see in this real world single seat race car, right? If we look at the, the red line here, which is the instantaneous uh, steer angle, um, their steer ratio, you can see that that zero steering wheel position, when the, when the steering wheel is in the straight ahead position, this particular car has a overall steering rate or it has a steering ratio. Um, degrees of steering wheel angle per uh, per degree of road wheel angle of a little bit more than 15 to 1. Um, but as the car, uh, as the steering wheel is turned to the left or to the right, um, 90 degrees, you can see it goes up sinusoidally, it goes up to uh, what appears to be sinusoidally, up to about, you know, almost 18 degrees. So it's a little bit slower. Uh, we say a little slower ratio even though it's a larger number, um, it takes more steering wheel angle to generate one degree of road wheel angle. So it's a slower, slower steering, right? Um, it goes up to about, so at 90 degrees, it goes up to about 18 to one and then back to at 180 degrees, it's gonna go back down to, you know, somewhere uh, close to the um, uh, 15 to one. Now, um, You'll say, well, what is it, this second line here? This blue line is actually a second order polynomial fit uh, through that data uh, because the um, the instantaneous steer ratio is not only, uh, as we'll see here in a minute, not only going to be a function of that uh, non-uniformity in the upper steering, um, it's it's also uh, uh, going to be affected by our lower steering, our our plan view steering uh, geometry or or uh, you may be familiar with it, with Ackerman, right? There's some amount of Ackerman steering in this particular vehicle um, that is causing the overall steer ratio, or the, I'm sorry, the steer ratio to change in a 
uh, uh, quadratic nature um, as we turn from you know straight ahead to uh, to the the extreme of the travel. Okay. So, like I said, so again, yeah, little the the steering ratio then is 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 going to be controlled by three. Uh, three transfer functions. So the first one we've we we talked about was that that upper steering non-uniformity. That's the uh the the um transfer function between you know the uh, steering gear pinion and the steering wheel. Right. Um the second it would be the steering gear transfer function. You know how much rack displacement do we have um uh, for for a given uh, pinion angle. And then the third is what we'll call the the steering linkage transfer function is how much road wheel angle do steer angle do we get for a given rack displacement. Okay. And so mathematically we can show these these transfer functions. So we could find um, the road wheel angle for a given pinion angle, um, if we you know know these these two transfer functions, right? The rack to pinion uh, transfer function, and then the road wheels uh, angle to rack travel uh, transfer function. The, the so that steering gear transfer function, um, and it may the, at first glance it may have looked familiar to you because it was the units of uh, displacement over angle or like say meters of rack travel per degree of uh, pinion angle. And so that is essentially our, our steering gear ratio, right? Or some people may call it the, the, the rack speed or the C factor, right? How much displacement, uh, axial displacement do I have of the rack for a given uh, unit rotation of, of the steering gear pinion? Right. So our um our typically will specify your steering gear ratio for rack and pinion, you know, in terms of you know how many you know units of meters of rack travel, you know, per one uh revolution of the pinion. And so because in, in this analysis we're 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 working in degrees, um we know that 360 degrees is one revolution. So um we can then um, convert our uh, this rack uh, rack travel to pinion angle uh, transfer function to be in, in terms of our uh, steering gear ratio. So we'll take our our steering gear ratio in meters per revolution of the pinion divided by three hundred and sixty. That gets us into um, meters per degree. Okay, which is this equation uh, equation six here? Oh, that should have said equation five. Okay, gotta fix that. Okay, the second um, transfer function then here is the, the road wheel to the rack travel. And so, um, you know, again, this, this which is the steering linkage uh, transfer function. Okay, and so this is uh, shown here. This is uh, some data. This is from actually a, a simulation. This is from an atom uh, simulation, steer simulation, um, where plotted uh, rack travel on the x-axis and road wheel angle on the y-axis. And the blue is the left front wheel, and the um, and the uh, red is is the left front uh, right front wheel. Right. And so positive sign convention. So if the rack is moving to the left. Um, it turns the road wheels to the um, to the right, which is indicative of um, a rear steer type of uh, type of geometry, right? The steering gear uh, mounted rear of the uh, of the wheel center. Right. But anyway, when you what you can see is that um, these lines don't lie on top of one it, one another. Well, they may at the very, you know, at, at zero of rack travel or small levels of rack travel. But as you move the rack farther and farther, you can see that the two curves uh, diverge. And they're both appear to be the, re the right front um, shown here appears to be uh, kind of a par parabolic up um, where the blue is like parabolic down. And so the difference between those uh, between those curves, the left and, and the right, is indicative of the amount of uh, of, of Ackerman um, that we have in the in the uh, in in our uh, lower steering system. Okay. All right. So, um, 
so we now we know you know again this we, we know the ro road wheel angle is a function of the pinion angle um the rack uh rack gear ratio and this this linkage transfer function and for for the sake of um uh simplicity we'll we'll assume right now that this uh we're going to assume that this for our example coming up that, that this uh linkage transfer function, steering linkage transfer function is constant, right? It's going to be linear, right? Um, okay, so so for the go-kart steering, right, where the, where the steering uh, wheel is directly connected to the steering gear pinion, we can use, you know, the pinion angle is going to equal the steering, kinematically, the pinion angle is going to equal uh, the steering wheel angle. Um, so... Uh, and I say kinematically because um, if we were to, you know, if we were to do a test on, you know, frictionless, you know, steer ratio test on frictionless plates, you know, at conceivably every um, degree, uh, you know, degree of steering angle is going to go into, you know, the, 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 the turning the steering gear pinion, you know, a one to one relationship. In reality, it's not. Um, if we were to do that steer test. Um, turning to the left, turning to the right with the car, with the driver in the car and the car sitting on um, the, the ground, right? Um, where we have reaction forces at the, at the tire contact patch. Now um, the drivers, not only are they applying a, a steer angle, they're applying a steer torque and there's resistive moment, a kingpin moment that's acting in the opposite direction, resisting it. And so if we have any compliance in our steering system, in the steering column, like torsional compliance in the steering column and the intermediate shaft or in the steering shaft and so forth, um, some of that torque is going to go to, you know, overcoming an angle is going to go to overcoming that um, that steer compliance before we we start to turn the steering gear pinion. So we'll we'll that's one of the additional requirements of the upper steering system is is make it stiff, right? You want every newton meter of torque and every degree of steering wheel angle um, to go towards you know turning the pinion um, and and eventually turning the road wheels and not overcoming you know having to overcome any compliance um, in the in the steering system. Okay. But for so, but kinematically, you know, for for the go kart steering system, um, we could we can calculate, you know, road wheel angle as a function of steering wheel angle using uh, that the, the equation we previously developed. If we put a carden joint between the steering column and the steering steering gear pinion, we kind of have to modify the road that kinematic road wheel angle equation to account for the, the angle variation between the output and the input of the, of the card and joint. So we're going to take that um, equation that we developed a, a, a few minutes ago, where the uh, the pinion angle is going to be a function of uh, the steering wheel angle, you know, the, um, and the, the spatial angle of the joint. And so we're going to plug that into this equation six, this equation above. And so now we've got... Um, this equation eight, which is going to be, you know, the road wheel angle as a function um, of the steering wheel angle um, and the, uh, the, the non-uniformity of that, uh, of that carton joint. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> so for that single carton joint, if we, and, and again, this is, um, you I'm, failed to mention, but this is all like you could do all this stuff in Excel, right? You can you're gonna you could take these equations, you can plug them into Excel, and you can um, you know you could you could generate the curves that we've shown thus far and will show um, subsequently. Um, I happen to have this handy, so uh, pardon you know apologize for being lazy, but um, this is some simulation data from from an Adams model again, and so this is. Um, on the x-axis is steering wheel angle, and the the y-axis is is the road wheel angle. Um, I'm assuming that the the rack gain or the gear ratio, uh, steering gear ratio is 0 0.052 or meters per rev or 52 millimeters per rev, which is kind of common for a, a passenger car. Um, and then that that linkage transfer function um, is 0 0.0025 meters of rack travel per degree of road wheel angle, or 20. I guess that would be 2.5. Um, millimeters of rack travel per degree of, of road wheel angle. 
And so what we're showing here is uh, different levels of spatial angle. And so the black line, solid black line is 180 degrees. And so you can kind of see that, um, you know, let's just say 100 degrees of, of steering wheel. Let's see. Now let's go 90 because um, I, I don't know why I do this, but um, 90 degrees is about uh, um, five and a half and 180 degrees is about, well, it should be about 11, but uh, 90 degrees is about, no, about five. That's it. 90 degrees is about five, 180 degrees is about 10. So you can see there's a, a one-to-one -one, uh, relationship. But as we um, decrease that spatial angle, right? This alpha one gets smaller. You can now see that we we start to have see that uh, case of the 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 lag lead, right? Where let's take the green. The alpha is is 135 degrees. You can see that as we turn the steering wheel, you can see that the road wheel angle, the rate of change of road wheel angle decreases, and then it crosses over, and then it increases. So it has that you know that sinusoidal. Uh, shape. Now, if we take the derivative of those curves and plot the, with the curve on the left, um, steering wheel angle on the x-axis and uh, overall steering ratio on the on the y-axis, now you can see that for the 180 degree case, everything in a straight line, um, that overall steering ratio is constant. But the ex other extreme, the 135 degrees, you could see that the overall steer ratio, whoops, come back here, overall steer ratio you know, starts at a little bit over 24. And then when you get to 90 degrees, um, it's down around 12. And then it goes back up to about about 20, you know, 24 at 180 degrees. Right. So again, this is what we call that that variable ratio um, effect of the of the upper steering. And uh, where to the driver, when you're driving straight ahead, you know, for the green one, say, you know, it takes more steering wheel angle to generate one degree of road wheel angle. So the vehicle will not be as responsive in the straight ahead position, right? Which which might be in a passenger car, I'm driving down the highway 70, you know, 70, 70 miles an hour, um, drinking a, you know, drinking a, a, a Starbucks and maybe, you know, uh, um, not fully paying the most attention, but you know, they would, but then, you know, we're driving along and, you know, the vehicle's not responsive. So it's generally staying in it, in its lane, but then say we take an exit and we do spirited driving on country roads um, where we're putting in 90 degrees of steer input, um, you know, doing spirited driving and roundabouts and country roads mm -hmm. and so forth. You know, the vehicles feels a little more uh, responsive. It takes less, you know, steering wheel angle to generate a little bit more um, road wheel angle. So, Perhaps this might be something that's, um, you know, uh, desirable. It perhaps it was to the, uh, you know, to whoever, whoever was a manufacturer of this car, because you can see, you know, they had the, the opposite where, you know, it was a low ratio on center where the, the vehicle was very responsive in a straight ahead position. And then it was a higher steering ratio at the, at the, uh, 90 degrees where you know, off center position. So maybe what they wanted is I, they, they wanted the driver to, you know, you know, the car to be more responsive, take less steering wheel angle for the turn in. But then when you're in a turn 90 degrees and you're dithering the steering wheel around, you know, 90 degrees, um, you know, the, the vehicle isn't uh, as responsive or it, it doesn't, you know, uh, it's, it's maybe a little more stable, um, you know, uh, f or feels a little more stable to the driver as they're, you know, adjusting the steering wheel position in a uh, steering wheel angle in a, in a turn. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. So again, so re remember we said that when, when this theta one is zero, the input yoke is perpendicular to the plane. Right. And then so because of this, that's that's why the steering ratio is a maximum um, when the steering wheel angle is zero. So now if we index this and we said, OK, at, at you know, at the, um, if we made theta one or we uh, rotated it so that at uh, with the steering wheel in the state ahead position, that input is in the plane, um, it would flip these curves. And so now we would have the overall steering ratio being low on center 
and then high at 90 degrees and, and back low. So there's there's some tuning flexibility associated with that. Okay. And again, we uh it's just the the real world um, example here, which I which I already talked about. So, so we we we've, we've been talking about variation steering wheel angle or the steering wheel angle effect, but there's also a steering torque effect. Okay, so um, there's also torque variation associated with with that carden joint running at a at a at a spatial angle less than 180 degrees. So um, there, there's also something called there's also uh, perpendicular forces in the carden joint that are called uh, the the secondary couple. Um, that can affect the side loading on, say, the steering gear pinion and bearings and so forth. Um, we're not going to talk about that. That's like that's like 201 type level. But um, if you're interested in that, um, again, going back to the the SAE Universal Joint and Drive Shaft Manual, they do a great job of talking about these uh, and giving you the equations to calculate these side load you know, forces in um, in reaction forces in the uh, in a carbon joint. Okay, but we're going to look at, at torque right now. So that so the torque uh, rotation uh, of, of the uh, of the joint. And so if we uh, we apply the conservation work to the input and output side of the uh, of the carden joint, right? So the the T one and theta one are going to be the input torque and the input angle, and the T two two and theta two are going to be the um, output torque and output angle. Um, we're going to do the, these take the integral, and then um, we end up with an equation here now where we've got the rate of change of angle um, as a as a function of time, right? And so, or the uh, angular velocity. So we come up with this equation here where um, the output for the conservation of work, we have the, you know, output uh, input torque times the input velocity is equal to the output torque times the output uh, velocity, that being angular velocity. Um, we rearrange um, and we get here the input torque over the output torque um, is equal to the output velocity over the, the input velocity. And this is on the right hand side of the equation. Uh, this is what we re refer to as this component is what we refer to as the velocity variation of the Cardin joint. So you can see that the velocity variation of the carden joint um, is is in inversely proportional to the um, the torque variation of the uh, of the carden joint. Okay. All right. Um, so if we go back, um, so we go back to this first equation. We're going to differentiate that, and we can because uh, it. it you know the, the tangent of the output angle is equal to the related to the tangent of the input angle um, by the cosine of 180 minus the spatial angle. We take the derivative of that um, and we get the velocity um, variation of a single u joint. And so you can see in the in the numerator we have the cosine of 180 minus the spatial angle, um, and then the denominator is now a function of not only the spatial angle but also the position or the input position, okay? And so we're gonna go back and we're gonna then use this equation nine. Um, we have the velocity variation. So we're gonna input, uh, take that uh, and, and put it into the torque equation. And so now we have the input torque um, as a function of, uh, versus the output torque as a function of you know, the, the spatial angles and the position. So if you think about it, um, to, let's just say the extreme cases is, is you have to, you're, you're, the car is sitting on a pavement, you know, statically, and you need a certain torque at the pinion to turn the wheels. And that torque is going to be based on, de dependent upon the, um, the weight of the car, the, um, the the steering geometry the the distance from you know the, the the kingpin or the kingpin offset the scrub radius kingpin inclination angle all those things that we talked about um, if you had, had uh, seen the uh, SAE presentation the video formula SAE uh, presentation recently uh, previously on the kingpin axis we talked about you know the the moments about the kingpin axis and then converting them to a, a torque to the pinion so 
Um, so again, so there's going to be some level of torque at the pinion required to steer the wheels. So if we have uh, some uh, uh, non-uniformity, what the driver is going to feel is is a chain for a given constant, you know, out um, torque uh, required at the at the the pinion. The driver is going to have to apply more torque, less torque, more torque, less torque. All right, and that's what we 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 typically call this lumpy steering feel, for for lack of a better term. It just feels lumpy. You know, it feels heavy, light, heavy, light. Um, so for our single U-joint, um, the output velocity variation, the input uh, variation um, are shown here. So um, again, our same four, you know, uh, situations, the black line being everything in a straight line and the other extreme is a 135 degree spatial angle. Right. And so the, the left axis is the output velocity variation. So you can see that the for a given uh, input angle on the X axis, um, the output velocity um, over the input velocity. So the output is going to be slow. The velocity is going to be seven tenths of the input velocity at zero. And then it's going to go to at 90 degrees. It's going to be 100 and 140 uh, uh, percent of of the input velocity and it's going to go back to 70%. So so what the, the wheel is seeing is for for a fixed velocity the wheel is going to see road wheel is going to be slow rotate slow steer faster steer slower steer. Um on the torque the input torque variation for a a given torque required at the pinion to to turn the wheels what the, the driver is going to feel is the driver is going to have to apply you know, 70% of that torque at the, at the steering wheel at straight ahead. And then as he turns farther to 90, it gets heavier. So he has to apply 140% of that torque and then back to 70%. So he's going to feel lighter, heavier, lighter. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. And so again, the with the with, as we said with the variance it's the same with the output velocity vari variation input torque variation um because we said that the that input yoke um at theta one equals zero or the input angle equals zero is is perpendicular to the plane um we're going to have a minima velocity variation in a minimum of torque variation um on center or straight ahead and then um again but again we can if then we design this where we 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 zero position our straight ahead steering wheel position that yoke is is in the plane um then we would get you know we would flip these curves okay. all right so um so suppose you don't want that that variation you want to do a single joint system but you don't want to you you know you don't want or you can't um your target your vehicle level targets um cascaded to the component level um say that you don't want to, or to, to the subsystem level say that you don't want any um velocity or torque variation um you can replace that uh single carton joint with a double carton joint and so uh again this is uh it, this is a uh, an example here this is again out of the SAE universal joint and drive shaft design manual it's a it's a drive shaft um uh example but I think it illustrates the usefulness of the double carden joint. And so you can see a double carden joint is essentially two carden joints um, that are connected by this, uh, this coupling yoke, right? And they are, um, th there is some uh, uh, um, math associated with it to properly, you know, again, phase the yokes such that when the, no matter what, you know, angle you're operating at, um, the input yoke is generally going to be, say, perpendicular to the, the plane, and the output yoke is going to be in the plane, such that when um, the input yoke is at a maxima, uh, the output is going to be at a minima, and they're going to cancel each other out. So this, this plot here over on the right 
Um, it shows the rotation of the driving shaft and, and rotational angle of the driving shaft. And, and on the, the left, um, rather than showing a velocity variation, it shows the angular velocity. So this um, this Cardan joint is is uh, this is driving or double carton or these examples um, we're driving the shaft at, at in this case 4,000 rpms because that's how you know how much you rotation you can or speed you can get from a drive shaft or might have in a drive shaft so um, you can see that if you had a carton joint let's take the extreme here the carton joint um, at 172 degrees spatial angle or eight degrees uh, complementary you can see that when you're you're driving, you know, the input is 4,000 RPM, but when this, the shaft is at the straight, you know, at zero, or theta one is at zero, um, the output is is uh, uh, is going to be 3,960. And then when it goes to 90 degrees, it's going to go to 4040, and then it's going to go back to 3,960. So you're going to have some velocity variation, even at 172 degrees, or right, which is kind of small, um, right, but if you have a double, let's take this other one, um, the third one down, this double carden joint, right, shown like, like here, uh, the double carden joint, and that's operating at 160 degrees, so even more uh, spatial angle, you can see that um, for this one, the if you're driving at 4,000 RPM, you're about you know 39.99 to 4,001 to 39.99, right? So you have little, you know, very little, um, uh, you know, velocity variation. Okay, so so again, the, the this example here is from it shown here is from um, a drive shaft application, but. Again, you could use this. It, it applies. The physics is exactly the same for a um, uh, for a steering system. Okay. All right. So, uh, next one we'll we'll talk about here. Then is we're, we're going to go to the um, the two joint system. All right. And so now we're going to we're going to because it's a little more complex. We're going to uh, identify some points here. Um, a, B, C, and D. A is going to be the uh, where the steering wheel attaches to the steering column. Uh, B is the center of the, uh, you know, the steering column to the upper eye shaft joint. Um, C is the uh, upper eye shaft to the, you know, the lower um, shaft joint, and then D is like the bottom of the of the steering gear pinion. All right, so I got A, B, C, D, and so A, B, C are going to define uh, the spatial plane of of joint B. Right or the upper joint, and B, C, D are going to define the spatial plane of of joint C. And there's going to be associated uh, alpha B and alpha C are the spatial angles respectively. And we we have to differentiate the angles between the input and the output. Um, so theta B I would be the input angle at at, at uh, input angle at joint B, and uh, theta B O um, is the output angle. Um, a joint B and corresponding, you know, theta C I is the input angle of joint C and, and C O is the output angle of joint C. And so what we can do, since these are basically two transfer functions, right, we can multiply them together. Um, the, the take that velocity uh, variation equation that we talked we uh, for a single carbon joint that we developed earlier, and we can multiply those two together to get um, the output at C, right? The output at C, output velocity at C, as a function of the input velocity at B. That the which is a useful equation. However, um, we're not happy because it's one equation and two unknowns, right? Um, we have the input at B, um, but we also have the the input at C, right? And we don't know that directly, right? Because the output at um, the output input at C is actually input uh, angle at C is going to be since the input of this the lower yoke the lower joint is directly connected to the output of the upper joint. Um, there's going to be as we saw that that sinusoidal or, or the um, 
th those are going to be equal. So what we can do is we can go back to the original equation of output is, is equal to the tangent of the output is equal to the tangent of the input uh, times the cosine of 180 minus the spatial angle. And we're going to plug that um, in for uh, for theta CI for the, and, and we now have this, uh, and we're going to do some simplification. And we now have this equation um, that we're happy with, um, one equation and one unknown. So we have the angular velocity output at C um, as a function of the input at B. And now in the numerator, it's, uh, it's a function of the, oops, 180 minus the spatial angle B minus 180 minus cosine 180 minus spatial angle at C. And then in the denominator, you can see that there is no CI. It's it's the input at B, All right? So one equation, one unknown, boom. All right. So again, for our, so if we go back to our car, our FSAE car, single seat race car, if if everything's coplanar, right? And it's like, everything is in a, in a straight line. You can use it. We can use this equation directly. Okay. Um, and as we'll see here in it in, in passenger cars, um, it's seldom that those those spatial angles are coplanar. Um, but but do not fret because we can take advantage of if we know um, the angle between the planes, um, we can uh, add a, a term called the phase angle uh, of the uh, of the U joints to. Uh, to make sure that uh, when the input is in perpendicular to the the input at B is is perpendicular uh, to the plane of the joint at B, the input at C is in the plane of uh, uh, of in in the plane of plane C. So when one's a a minima, the other one's going to be a maxima. They're going to cancel each other out. Okay, um, so. Um, again, so to achieve zero velocity and torque variation uh, of this coplanar system, the spatial angles have to be have to be equal. Okay, so again, going to um, the the equation here, um, if you just meant you know did some mental math and said, okay, if you know if if alpha b and alpha c um, are equal, so then um, and I, you know, kind of plug those numbers in, we'll see that, you know, with the steering wheel angle on the x-axis, uh, the velocity variation, it's going to be, um, it's, it's going to be one, right? The output is when everything's in a straight, and physically that, that kind of makes sense that everything is in a straight line, right? And so it's a direct connection between the steering column and the, and the steering gear pinion. So we have a one-to-one -one relationship between uh, the input um, input at a rotational input at a and the um, the uh, you know the output um, at c but you could see that then we do some examples here and again this is this is spreadsheet engineering here so you can tell by the by the excel um, the, the excel style uh, plot here um, so let's just say you know that the magenta line here we have a five degree difference in angle um, between the between the two. And so uh, the alpha one, the spatial angle uh, or alpha A, uh, alpha B, um, I apologize, it's inconsistent, but the, the first spatial angle is 165 and the second is 160. So you can see that um, we start with a little bit higher variation, velocity variation. We go uh, 90 degrees, it's lower and then, uh, and then higher again, right? And then um, if we if we go to um, 165, um, so we go 165 and 155 are now a 10, 10 degree difference between we get this yellow line. And so you could see that the variation is a little bit more. And then 165 and 150, there's 15 degree difference. And you can see the variation is is a little bit even a little bit more. Okay. All right. Okay. Again, spreadsheet engineering, just taking, you know, just taking this equation right here, this equation 13, plugging it into Excel and uh, setting up a table where you have, uh, you know, the steering wheel angle, theta bi, or the steering wheel angle is, as your input. 
um, and your velocity variation is your output and boom. Okay. So a couple notes about this. It, so the first one I alluded to that, you know, the peak to peak variation increases um, with increasing difference in the spatial angle. But the second one is if you have um, a larger spatial angle at B um, and it's going to be fast on center. So again, um, this, this, the purple one here, the straight line is spatial angles equal. Um, this dot dashed one, um, you could see that the spatial angle, we have 165 at the at B and 150 at C. And so you could see it starts fast on center, um, slow at 90 degrees, faster at 180. But then if we flipped it around, right? And now the alpha one or the, the, the spatial angle at B is 150 and the spatial angle at uh, C is 165 still that 15 degree difference, you can see the curve just flipped. And so now we're slow on center, uh, uh, fast at 90 degrees, slow at 180. So we can change from um, you know fast or slow on center by changing the magnitude of those, uh, those spatial angles. The other thing we could do um, if we wanted to flip is if we, if we uh, what we say, we, we could rotate, like, like I said, we could rotate the whole system or index um, the whole system 90 degrees. So now um, that input yoke at B, you can see from the cartoon here, it goes from, you know, being per shown this red, you know, per being perpendicular to the plane ABC. Um, it is now gone to being um, here in the plane ABC, right? And so we go from uh, this, uh, this dot dashed here, which was being perpendicular to the plane where we were fast on center. And then we go to, uh, with with a perpendicular to the plane, and then we, we get slow on center where we're um, uh, in the plane, okay? So again, there's, there's some opportunities if we, if we index uh, the system um, to get uh, uh, different, uh, different levels of performance, okay? Um, again, if we know the average steering ratio, um, we can multiply the average steering ratio by the inverse of that velocity variation to get the, the instantaneous steering ratio. So say um, we had an average steering ratio of, of six to one. So I, and, and I'm not sure if this is common, uh, an FSAE. I just took, hey, if we got, you know, uh, we want 180 degrees of steering angle and we got 30 degrees of road wheel angle. Um, that's where I kind of came up with a six to one. But anyway, um, so if we know that average steering wheel angle, we can multiply that um, by the inverse of the um, um, velocity variation at a given steering wheel angle and get the instantaneous uh, overall ratio as a function of steering wheel angle. All right, so you can see that we can get now the plot is x-axis is steering wheel angle, y-axis is steering ratio. And uh, you can see that we can and you get this, you know, variable re ratio gear effect um, that if we, if we so desire. Okay. Um, and again, just really quick, because uh, I know we're getting towards the end um, and want to keep time for some questions, but uh, just really quick um, about you know, the um, two card and joint systems and passenger cars. And again, just shown here on the left-hand side is is some uh, drawings of, or pictures of kind of a typical two, two joint system in a, in a passenger car. And the, the important thing that I want, we want to illustrate is that, you know, is, is really in the, in the rear view and in, in the rear view, um, you could see that it's not a straight line from the, down the steering column to the steering gear pinion. So there is some, you know, uh, some, some rear view angle um, in that intermediate shaft. So what happens then is if we're going to have some angle um, between the planes. So if we're looking down, I'm on the right-hand side here, if we're looking in the Z direction, we're looking down that shaft. Um, so we've got A, B, you know, the, the plane A, B, C here in the, the dotted line and B, C, D in the dash line, there's going to be some angle between the planes. Um, and so 
if we have unequal spatial angles and you know a a um angle between the planes we're going to get some velocity and torque fluctuation in, in the upper steering um but if we want to minimize it what we're going to do is we're going to rotate um this um rotate the the uh input yoke you know at at joint or at the lower input yoke um, relative to the upper joint output yoke by what we call the phase angle. So there's going to be some slight rotate rather than having that shaft, everything in a straight line, there's going to be some slight rotation. Um, and we call that the phase angle. And so we do, if the phase angle is equal to the angle between the planes, um, then it's going to then cancel out or it's going to minimize the amount of, of uh, velocity variation. Um, it's not going to cancel it because again, it's, it's, if it, it will still have some velocity variation if the angle, um, um, spatial angles at B and C are not the same. So, um, so what we have then is in, implementing that idea of the, of the, the angle between the planes, the phase angle is this gamma and, and delta is the angle BC is the, the angle between the planes. And so I'm not going to go through the derivation of this, but um, it's here for you to uh, to use. Again, spreadsheet engineering, you can plug it directly into Excel um, and, and, and use it. Um, but you could see that uh, the equation becomes much more, much more complex. Um, so here's here's an example then um, of a two cardin non-coplanar two joint system. So the, so the red, um, we have the, the upper joint is at 150 degrees, the lower is at 155 degrees. So, so five degree, uh, difference in the spatial angles. Um, if we don't do anything, if we have a 15 degree angle between the planes and we don't do anything, we don't put a phase angle, you can see that we have velocity variation, right? But the other thing is that the, the minima is now is not at zero. The minima is at some non-zero degree. Um, so what the driver would feel in terms of torque and, and maybe variation in response is that initially we're turning the, turning the wheel and they'll feel, oh, the efforts are, are dropping as I turn, start turning, but then they're building up again or the vehicle responds faster, but then it, as I turn maybe 30 degrees, but then as I start to turn fast, you know, turn a little bit more, um, it responds more. And then I get to 90 degrees or a little past 90 degrees, and now it starts to respond less again. So it, it and then the other thing we're only show, like say turning to the right, but turning, if you uh, flip this plot over, and so we have plus or minus 180 degrees, um, you would see that the, the vehicle has a different response, you know, steering to the left and steering to the right because of that slope, non-zero slope through center. Okay. Um, okay. So lastly, um, some additional requirements for the upper steering system. First one is, is you got to make it durable, right? Driver safety is, depends on a durable steering set system. So you got to perform those sizing calculations on, on the shafts, you know, uh, the torsional, you know, stiffness and, and fatigue and, and so forth on the, uh, and, uh, on the shafts, um, sizing calculations on the fasteners, uh, just to ensure they won't fail after, after repeated cycling, right? Make it stiff, right? We want to perform the stiffest calculations of the system, um, come, come up with some overall stiff, torsional stiffness top target of, you know, how many, if you, if you were to say, for example, you constrain the, the, the uh, lower, you know, the, the steering gear pinion and you apply a torque to the steering wheel, right? Minimize, you know, set some target of, you know, how many Newton meters per degree, Newton meters of torque per degree of steering wheel angle that, that you're going to accept from that, you know, the, the structural stiffness and then cascade that down to, um, you know, to to the component torsional stiffness, the the steering column, the intermediate shafts, uh, um, and so forth, uh, steering shafts, right? They're all springs in series, 
It's just all springs in series between the steering wheel and the uh, the steering gear pinion. Um, and then the other thing is you, you want to eliminate any free play between the steering wheel, quick connect, and the steering column. This is something that we've seen, you know, as, as a design judge, this is something that we see all the time is that the steering wheel, you, you can like, you know, grab onto the steering wheel and turn it and there's, you know, free play, you know, in, in the steering wheel. So try to minimize that as, as much as possible. Um, make it smooth, right? You want to select components and bearings. You want to analyze the system to minimize the rotational friction. You want every Newton meter that the driver puts in to go towards uh, turning the steering gear pinion, you know, and not overcoming any any upper steering fr friction, right? You want you want every Newton meter to go towards making those eventually making those road wheels turn, and then make it comfortable, right? You want to consider the angle of the steering column off the horizontal to maximize the driver comfort. Um, and the visibility, like say if you have chassis mounted gauges, you know, the, the visibility of the gauges. Okay. Um, so in summary, you know, we talked about the upper steering system and, you know, being comprised of steering wheels, steering column, intermediate shafts. We talked about the three most commonly used upper steering system architectures, go-kart, single, uh, single joint and, and two joint. Um, we talked a little bit, we can, can, uh, uh, compared and contrasted single seat race car upper steering systems and passenger car upper steering systems. Um, you know, the go-karts, we talked about go-kart steering is a, it's a direct connection. It's a straight line between the steering wheel and the steering gear pinion. Um, the single, single joint upper system has one joint between the steering column and the pinion. Um, we spent a lot of time talking about the, you know, the output versus input. Um, relationship for a single carbon joint and that they they vary it's going to vary sinusoidally um, with steering with uh, rotational angle when that spatial angle is is less than 180 degrees and again that that whole idea of the, the being in the perpendicular to the plane and being in the plane so for a, a single carbon joint the velocity variation and, and torque variation output torque variation is going to be a minima when the input yoke is perpendicular to the plane and it's going to be a maxima um, when the input yoke is in the plane. Um, we talked about the steering ratio, right? Rate of change of steering wheel angle with respect to road wheel angle at a given steering wheel position and, and the three transfer functions that make it up, uh, non-uniformity steering gear and steering linkage. Um, we get we talked about how we can, if we know that, that velocity variation or the non-uniformity, um, we can we can get the instantaneous steer ratio uh, by multiplying that by the, the, the average steering ratio. Um, we looked at two card and joint systems. Oops, sorry. Um, and then, you know, the FSAE two card and joint system is typically coplanar, like everything lies in a, in a straight line. And then uh, some, some fun facts about the two card and joint system, um, you know, is that we, the the main thing is having the the spatial angles in the, the the two card and joint coplanar system having those two joints you know everything lie in a straight line um yeah and then the additional requirements durability high stiffness friction comfort to the driver all right so with that um how'd i do daryl you are pretty much right on time tim so just a reminder, there are a, a couple more uh, uh, presentations coming up next Friday, the uh, alignment and suspension geometry presentation. And then in February, we'll have an in-person workshop at Lawrence Tech here in the Detroit area with a whole series of other presentations. <clears throat> and then Saturday, March 16th, there's a student career fair at the SEMA Garage Detroit, which is in actually in Plymouth, Michigan. So if anybody has any questions, uh, we can stick around a few minutes longer and, uh, and answer those. Just post them in the meeting chat. And until uh, somebody else has questions, I have a couple for you, Tim. Um, first of all, now we know all about uh, how to calculate steering ratio variation. Why would we want it or not want it in a Formula SAE car? Oh, that is that is a great question. Um, I guess it uh, it it depends. <laughs> it it depends. Um, 
the it depends on how your uh, you know your, your targets, your vehicle level targets that you set for um, you know for for uh, for your for your car. So that that overall overall ratio or that steering ratio change um, is hopefully through the anecdotes. You know, you we realize it's going to affect the responsiveness um, of the vehicle, right? Um, and and how the response, you know, the the yaw rate and and lateral acceleration um, change as a function of steering wheel angle, but also the the efforts. So that characteristic, um, a lot of that comes from would be based on driver feedback, right? And so, um, again, it's, it's, it's not, as you can see, it's not something that you can easily change, right? Um, even, you know, maybe, maybe indexing, you know, to, to flip a, the curves around, you could do relatively quick, but changing the, the magnitude of that, that variation is, is kind of difficult. So, um, it's something if, if, based on the driver feedback that you get from either testing or or at the end of the season, if the driver said, hey, the efforts are a little bit high or a little bit low on center, or the vehicle turns, you know, too much or not enough as I as I steer farther away from center, um, those that type of feedback can then be translated into a upper steering design with some, you know, very vari variable ratio effect. Okay. And then uh, the second question I had is you, you mentioned compliance and the need to, to minimize it. Uh, but what what are typically the, the heavy hitters? What are the main sources of compliance in the steering system? What should we look at first? Yeah. In, in, in the upper steering system, uh, specific to, to the upper steering, um, the I would say the in an FSAE car, probably the, the 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 torsional stiffness of say your your steering shaft or or, or any um, intermediate shaft. Um, the the other thing though too is it is is any free play, right? Because free play any free play that you have is, is a source of of compliance. So first things the the big hitter is just making sure that your your joints are are secure. Um, they're not. Uh, uh, you don't have any lash. Like I, the, the one you know that we see as as design judges is is the steering wheel to the, you know, to the quick connect between the steering wheel to the steering column, right? Or um, you know any free play that you might have between you know your uh, the the uh, univ or the cardan joint connected to the steering column or cardan joint connected to the to the steering gear, minimizing that, you know, um, that, that compliance there, um, or that lash is, pro is probably number one. Yeah. Okay. But again, they're all, again, it's all, all those components are springs in series, right? And so, you know, think about if, if each one of those, if you have, uh, steering wheel let's just say steering wheel to 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 steering column torsional stiffness and in series with the steering column torsional stiffness in series with the intermediate shaft torsional stiffness right those it's it's one over the total is one over the first stiffness of the first plus one over the stiffness of the second plus one over the stiffness of the third so you may think that an individual component may be stiff enough but when you stack them all up you know, it's, it's going to be a fraction of the, of the, you know, the maximum in individual stiffness. So. Yeah. It's not going to be any stiffer than the, the least stiff component. Right. Okay. Well, I don't see any questions in the chat and we are a few minutes over time. Oh, here's a question just popped up. It says, I have seen teams support the upper column and lower column with their upper support, and I've seen others support the upper column in the middle of the double cardon. Could you explain the differences there? 
Hmm. Um, I guess it, in general, the, um, you know, there's more than one, obviously more than one solution, but uh, I think that the, the, at the end of the day, it's making it as, you know, it, it, the, the support as stiff as possible while um, minimizing the amount of torsional or the amount of uh, torsional friction in the, uh, you know, in, in the system. So, um, the, the, again, they say the, you know, they say the, the, the best part is the part that isn't there. Right. So if you feel, you know, if you do your analysis and you feel that, you know, I can get, um, the proper support for, um, the steering column and the intermediate shaft by just having a single bearing and, you know, and minimizing the torsional friction, you know, then, you know, then, then that would be the way to go. So it's in the details. It's all in the details. So. Okay. Okay. So I don't see any further questions. Uh, we can wrap this up. Um, as I mentioned, we have some upcoming events. You do need to register for those events at sae-detroit.org as shown on the screen there. Um, and I want to thank Tim and both the Detroit section staff and the Carolina section SAE staff for helping us put all this together today and, and hosting the event. And then if you have any questions, I think, Tim, if you go to the next slide, the final slide, if you have any questions or feedback, um, you can email events at sae-detroit.org SAE uh, with your questions or feedback. So thank you for uh, joining us today. And if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, please please like the video and uh, share it with anybody you think could benefit from it. And also subscribe to our YouTube, YouTube channel. Thanks everyone, have a good day and have a good weekend. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Daryl.